His Excellency Paul Kagame, President of Rwanda, His Excellency Felipe Jacinto Yusi, President of the Republic of Mozambique, uh, His Excellency Dr. Patrick Emery Trovoada, Prime Minister and Head of uh, Government of the Democratic Republic of Sao Tome, and his spouse, Nanature Trovoada, His Excellency Robert Begre Mambe, Prime Minister of and Chef, Chief of Government of the Republic of Cote d'Ivoire, uh, His Excellency Hugh Alexandre Barrochambrier, Vice Pre, uh, Prime Minister of Gabon, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome again to the 2024 edition of the CEO Forum. First, I would like to thank our gracious host, President Kagame, and the Rwandese people for their warm hospitality and the unwavering commitment to private sector development. I would like also to thank Amin Berry Ahmed and the team of Jeune Afrique for partnering with us to create this uh, flagship event, the premier Pan-African Forum for promoting and supporting African businesses and economies. I would like also to thank, to thank the CEO of the Rwanda Development Board, Mr. Gatere, for his hospitality and for the leadership he has shown in organizing this event. It's with a lot of enthusiasm that I stand before you today to reflect on a remarkable journey. I was uh, lucky to be there in uh, Geneva more than 10 years ago when this initiative was launched. Today is happening in Africa, and we had an opportunity to discuss in Africa the pivotal role of innovation in tackling the challenges faced by African economies. Since then, the pace of change has not only accelerated, but it has been taking, uh, reaching some, some, some height. So the question we must now ask is how Africa can see the opportunities presented by the tech revolution that is reshaping the way we live, we work, and we do business. Artificial intelligence is quickly becoming a mainstream of technology, akin in some way to what electricity was a century ago with the potential to revolutionize the production of goods and services. This is why the economist calls a generalized purpose technology. Its applications are vast and varied, from design and economics to education and medicine, and already billions of dollars are being channeled into this exciting sector. Two days ago, Google, one of the big tech, was having its annual event. They were mentioning hundreds of billions of dollars that will be invested in this sector and how it will be changing the way we are producing goods. The question is, where Africa stands in this process? I think there are good things which are happening. I would like to highlight a couple of them to illustrate what I want to say. Here in Rwanda, when you talk about innovation, this country has been adopting technology at a very fast pace. And the best example, and we're honored to be associated to this effort, was the production of mRNA vaccines. And I remember vividly when this challenge was put before African leaders, our people didn't believe that it could happen in this continent. And I'm very proud to see how Rwanda has taken this challenge forward and making a, a reality. By doing that, this is placing, placing African countries on the global map of vaccine production, and also signals the dawn of a burgeoning biotech industry. I would like to emphasize that the AI part of the BioNTech was developed by an African startup, which was bought after BioNTech. So the knowledge was here in the continent. We are now exploring the next phase. We're talking about genomics. Genomics that leverage the rich biodiversity and genetic resources of the continent, laying the groundwork for precision medicines and the development of treatments tailored to the specific needs of African population and diaspora. This is an example of where Africa is taking its claims in a sector that has long been dominated by other regions. All of us can take immense pride in the collaborative project underway in Rwanda, in Senegal, and the corporations that produce these tri striking results. This is what I call African continent free trade area in action. But the question one wants to ask, 
how to multiply this good example. How we don't make this example not an exception, but the rule. I think that to move in that direction, a few conditions need to be met. First, digitalization. Data is a new gold. I repeat, data is a new gold. Secondly, reform and invest our, educa our education systems with a particular emphasis on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and that by distributing equally between women and men. It's heartening to see Rwanda hosting a regional institute of mathematics and IT-ing and forging partnership with very renowned academic institutions. This is an example that needs to be multiplied and repeated across the continent. We need to support also our startups. It's imperative that more funding, especially from domestic private sector, is directed towards this vibrant sector. At IFC, we're trying to do that with our Direct Disruptive Technology Fund, and we are trying to invest in, in startups that are investing in technology that will make a difference for development. But we need more billionaire in Africa. We need more millionaire in Africa to believe in these startups and invest in it. These startups are still largely funded with resources coming from the Silicon Valley or the part of the world. This is a challenge that the continent has. The fourth element is the dialogue, the leadership. We know that country has been developing a public-private partnership and dialogue. A lot of discussion are happening in countries, but there are very rare opportunities where the private sector of the continent is meeting the leadership of the continent. If you want to move forward with the African Free Trade Agreement, these fora need to be created because we want to build African supply chain, African value chain. Therefore, I think that the challenge will be to think about organizing this fora where leadership can hear from the private sector, but also private sector hear the constraints that leaders are facing. Fourth, we need to make sure that businesses in Africa have, can access to the best brain and the best talent on the continent. We need to have free movement of people, free movement of talent. We cannot move in the free African agreement if people cannot come and work in the neighboring African countries, when it's easier for them to go and work in another place, or another continent, and work on their own continent. And I would like to really praise and thank President Kagame for allowing free visa for African citizens to allow the best brain to come and visit the country. This is the way we will be building the human capital. The resource of Senegal could be here. The resource of Tanzania could be in Mali. The resource of, of Kenya could be in Cote d'Ivoire. That's the way the continent will be building this center of excellence. Let me tell you another sector besides health that I think is important for Africans to create jobs to improve the living condition of people, which is agriculture and energy transition. Let me start with energy transition. We are in a situation now over, the, over a, the past decade that Africa has seen a significant increase in the production of renewable energy, being solar, wind, and now green hydrogen. But while we have made commendable strides, financing direct investment and mobilizing a large share of this investment in Africa, there is still much to be done. Today, for, instance, for example, 600 million people do not have access to electricity in Africa. There is an energy, energy crisis which is hampering competitiveness, digitalization, and economic transformation. In response, the World Bank Group is pushing for having an initiative by 2030 to connect 300 million Africans. This is an ambition goal that will require a lot of work for all of us in the room. But without it, we cannot talk about the transformation of the continent. But as we're moving in that area, we need to look at what are the constraints. A lot of our utilities are not in a good shape, which limits the ability of the private sector to, in to invest in generation. 
We don't have enough private sector investment in transmission. We don't have enough private sector investment in distribution. All these are factors which are limited the ability to invest in the sector, which is so crucial for the development of Africa. But as we are thinking about it, we are just consuming the products that are needed to generate renewable energy, or Africa will think as being part of the value chain for the production of these uh, product uh, items which are so important. Africa has a lot of the critical minerals, have copper, have a lot of mining, mining products which are essential to the digital transformation and the renewable energy. How can we work together to make sure that the supply chain, the transformation of it is happening in the continent and therefore not only electricity is brought to the poorest of this continent, but also we are creating jobs by doing that. I would like to talk about another topic, which is close to my heart. And I quote uh, a singer that uh, people liked in Africa, Bob Marley, a hungry mob is a hungry mob. I'm talking about food. If people are not fed, the country are unstable. Not only is it unstable, but the productivity of people is going down. So today, we have faced in the last five years a crisis whereby African countries were suffering of not having fertilizers, of not having wheat, and were depending largely from the rest of the world. And the fluctuation on the world market affected so much the macroeconomic situation of countries. That Africa has arable land, Africa has water, Africa has people. So why the continent cannot produce food at the level which allow us to protect our macroeconomic situation, but also to improve the well-being of people? This is something which is very close to my heart, and I think is at our reach. In that context, I'm glad to have seen recently progress made in the production of fertilizers. I see largest investments this year was in the fertilizer sector in Nigeria. We invested also in Morocco in this area. But this is just one input. There are many other inputs which are important and essential to create and have a production of agriculture which is needed for the continent. We need to solve the issue of land. We need to ensure that the small farmers are not excluded for this. We need to ensure that we attract large investors in this sector. Those are those challenges that we are facing and which are here in our hand if we act collectively and we can solve. We cannot go another decade talking about hunger, food security in the continent. This will be our responsibility if it's not solved. In closing, I would like to talk about something which is important that gather everybody here, which is financing. Where is the money? Looking at the capital market in Africa, we have seen that the capital market is very shallow. And one of the reasons is that there is not enough public offering. And we need to work towards offering to the middle class, the citizens of African countries, an opportunity to hold part of the assets that are in their countries. So we will be calling countries to have more, particularly for the SOEs, to opening the capital of the SOEs to the citizens of their countries. To say the electricity company belongs to you also. Buy shares. If this company doesn't do well, you will not earn money. So they will have an interest in making this company work. And if we extend that approach in all sectors, we will be stopping capital flow which is affecting our countries. People are putting their money outside because they don't have opportunities to invest locally. So let's make sure that we are creating assets for people to invest in, in mass in our continent. Secondly, we need to talk about equity. When you talk to investors in the continent, they all tell us we don't have enough equity. We need to do more equity support and reduce the leverage that the bank, that the company has. That's something that IFC will be focusing in the coming years. We intend to double the size of our equity portfolio. That's the way we believe that our initiative of African champion will be a lasting initiative. Initiative will create a strong class, middle class of African producers who can be part 
of the world economy and the world market. So doing that, I think that we'll be able to have the saving of the elite going to less productive activities and go to more productive activities because they will be finding a very important return and very high return in their investment. So I will stop by saying this thing. 10 years ago, we had this slogan, Africa can. Today, we cannot repeat that slogan. The slogan should be Africa is. Africa is what? Africa is creating job for its youth. Africa is building resident growth. Africa is fostering a robust private sector free of bureaucratic hurdles. Africa is nurturing a healthier population with longer lifespan and ensuring that women have equal rights and opportunities to engage in productive activities. I will leave you with this quote of President Kagame. Africa's story has been written by others. We need to own our problems and solutions and write our story. Thank you very much.